You're playing fetch with your doggy when all of a sudden you see something falling down from the sky. It's glowing and has a large tail behind it. It's speeding down at an alarming rate, getting ever closer. You try to grab your pooch to take it inside, but it goes stubborn, barking and growling. But then you look up and notice the shining UFO becoming more like a ball, and it looks like it's heading towards you. You run around your backyard trying to catch your hound, but this time it thinks you're playing with it and runs away from you. You improvise and chase it to go inside the house, and great timing too. The object in the sky flashes so brightly you can't even look at it, and then boom! It's like a small piece of the sun just crashed right behind your house. You leap behind a couch and try to take a look at what happened. Your neighbors knock on your door to see if you're alright. Once you open to them, they all flood in with their cameras. You collect yourself and head back to the backyard where everyone is gathered around. You make your way to the object, and you can already feel the warmth that gives off. It looks like a regular fist-sized rock lying in a hole in the ground. You observe it from all corners and try to get the best angles. You once read that you shouldn't pick up a meteorite if it ever lands in your backyard. You can't find your gloves. But instead, you cut off some fresh aluminum foil to grab hold of the rock. You head back outside and see someone already touching it and taking selfies. You immediately rush to the scene. You take the rock from the onlookers and place it in a Ziploc bag to protect it from humidity or anything in the atmosphere that could potentially damage it. It's still wrapped in the foil, too. A large meteorite would be too hot to touch if it fell from the sky. But something about that size would cool down before hitting the ground. By grabbing it with your bare hands, you may contaminate the meteorite with skin oils and microbes that could harm its surface. Anything that falls from space isn't meant to be played with like a toy. So you take it away and all the neighbors disperse. Sorry everyone, but the party's over. You call the space agency and they rush over to collect the sample from you. A few days later, a severe storm comes to your neighborhood and you see a billboard on the other side of the street falling down from the wind. And then all the lights go off. Ah, great! When the raging is over, you grab your toolbox and go outside to fix the electrical works. What a way to spend your Sunday! You make your way to the shed, but a large puddle of water on your grassy lawn is in your way. No big deal, you just go around it. But a little voice inside your head tells you to stop and deal with that. Ah, come on! You put the tools down and get in some proper gear to clean up that puddle. Though it may sound kind of cool to have a mini lake in your backyard, you're essentially creating a breeding ground for mosquitoes and other pests to thrive. You wouldn't want a swarm of those buzzing blood drinkers keeping you up all night and leaving you itchy every day. Also, having a pet around unsupervised could be hazardous, as it may take a lap from the contaminated water. And what's even worse is that this puddle is right next to the electrical chamber, which is a recipe for disaster. So after a long day, you manage to dry up the stagnant water and fix up your lawn as well. You fix the electricity issue too, and are able to enjoy the rest of the day with your dog. You're enjoying some delicious burgers in your backyard. You take a few bites and reach out to munch on some fries, but you grab onto something that doesn't feel too french fry You take a look and see a full-grown wasp crawling around your lunch. You get up and go into a full freak-out mode, tossing your burger away and running inside your house. You shut the door and grab onto your dog. Yeah, you may have overreacted just a tad bit. But anyway, You're looking at your freshly grilled patties laid out on the table and see another wasp join the first, and then another, and another. You step back outside and try to find where they're coming from. You glance about suspiciously, and as you walk around, you notice a wasp flying back and forth from the grill to an area by the roof. One goes back to the roof, and two other wasps come out. Yep, there's definitely a wasp nest over there. You grab a ladder from the shed and climb up to see a small hole in your roof where the wasps created a nest. And it's a good thing they made that nest outside. There have been cases where people found wasp nests inside their homes, behind closets and cupboards in their kitchen. Your dog wanders outside and tries to get a bite off of one of those patties. The wasps around seem intimidated and fly around your dog to give it a good warning. 
But luckily, you jump to the rescue, snatch your dog away, and tuck it inside. Wasps don't usually sting humans unless agitated. And the difference between good old honeybees and wasps is that the latter can sting multiple times. But wasps are still extremely beneficial for us because they keep insect populations in check. Wasps don't become prey as often as other creatures, which is why farmers even deploy some onto their crops. At this point, the wasps have taken over your little grill and left you alone inside. They invite more of their friends and are even playing cool party games. You look at your dog and it's extremely disappointed in what happened. The best thing to do in such a situation would be to call pest control and move the nest to another location. It's really risky to do that on your own. But at least you can do another grill out without any wasps bothering you. Watch out for those mosquitoes, though. Another great afternoon in the yard playing with your dog. But this time, it seems distracted by a noise coming from behind the bushes. It runs all the way there and starts digging. You run over to check what's going on and find cute little puppies crying and crawling about. Amazed, you take a closer look at the puppies and notice they don't look like ordinary dogs. They have a kind of orangish shade to their fur and pointy ears. Well, congratulations! You've just found a little fox den in your backyard. Or rather, your dog found it. These babies are hungry and could use some food. But it's better to wait for their mama to come and bring some goodies. It's pretty common to see foxes around urban areas, especially places that are built in already existing fox habitats. But you're in total shock seeing one right behind your house. You count seven cubs in the litter, and all of them seem pretty healthy and good. Many of them are playful and friendly. Some are shy and hide away. Animals can be really protective of their young, so best stay low for now. And don't let your dog around them either. The mama fox might take it as a threat, and that wouldn't be something nice to see. Foxes eat almost anything and wouldn't think twice about rummaging in trash for scraps of food to eat. You take your dog inside, again, and try to figure out what to do. Moving some cute cubs may sound like a harmless and fun thing to do, but handling such creatures at their age could potentially harm them. Any slight pressure around certain parts of their bodies can damage them. Not to mention ticks or fleas these babies may have. Being exposed in the outdoors leaves them vulnerable to all sorts of nasty vermin lurking around. So you grab your phone and call animal control to report the fox death. And once they arrive, they finally deal with this issue. Gee, what an interesting backyard you have! Leaving your valuables or a chocolate bar in a car is a no-brainer. But there are other things people often overlook. Here's what to watch out for before leaving your car. Number 1 is aerosol cans, hairspray, deodorant, spray paint, household cleaner, and that sort. On the back of these cans, you might notice a storage temperature recommendation. Well, stick to that. Here's what can happen. Since these cans are pressurized, they become more sensitive to temperature. What's inside the aerosol may expand, and this may result in a crack. And then, the can can blow up. Temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit are already alarming, and it can easily get as hot as that in your car on a warm summer day. Researchers from the USA have figured out how long it takes a car to turn into a sweat factory on a hot day. Within one hour, the insides of the car parked in the sun reaches 95 degrees Fahrenheit or hotter, with an average temperature of 116 degrees Fahrenheit. So, if you want your car in one piece and running, take aerosol cans with you. The second item is sunscreen. Sunscreen is vital for your skin since it decreases the risk of skin complications and prevents skin aging caused by the sun. This includes wrinkles, sagging, and age spots. But when you leave sunscreen in your car, it gets exposed to high temperatures, and it can ultimately shorten its shelf life. If you end up finding spoiled sunscreen, you might notice a funny smell when you open the cap. Plus, the heat might cause the cap to open, and the sticky substance will get all over the car. The same rule applies to lipsticks and other cosmetics as well. The next one is plastic bottles. 
There are two reasons why you shouldn't leave them inside your car. Firstly, a plastic water bottle can act as a lens, magnifying the sun's rays and starting a fire. A fire department in Oklahoma conducted an experiment and confirmed that the danger of fire was real. David Richardson from that department says it can happen if the beam of light is focused enough. The second reason is related to your health. Many plastic bottles contain bisphenol, a potentially toxic compound. The BPA levels can increase at high temperatures, and that can be harmful to your body. There's a chance that this chemical can get into your drink after you leave the bottle inside the vehicle. Oh, and batteries! They can lose their capacity to work at full power when they're left abandoned in the car. You can buy a new pair and fix this problem, but it won't be as easy to solve the problem of leakage or a rupture. It can be bad for your health because battery acid is dangerous when inhaled and highly corrosive. The reason for leakage is again related to high temperatures. Battery manufacturers recommend keeping their products at room temperature. This fact is partially related to batteries. It's about electronics. Have you ever realized how hot your phone can get when it's exposed to the sun? You're driving and let's say looking at the GPS on your phone. Even in this situation, your phone can heat up. What will happen to it after hours of sun exposure? Phone companies are strongly against customers leaving their devices in vehicles because they might shut down, get damaged, or, you know, boom! Personal belongings are another priority on the list. A wallet or a handbag may come to one's mind first. Yet, a passport or even some change you leave near the passenger seat is sometimes enough to attract a thief. Better to keep such stuff out of sight, for example, by storing it in the trunk instead of leaving it in the back seat. Number seven is also related to theft. Life can be too hectic sometimes, and it's understandable if you can't clean your car frequently, but leaving garbage in the car is another mistake. Thieves tend to search for messy looking cars, they think that the owner doesn't use such a vehicle frequently. How about plants? I know it isn't that common to keep plants in the car on a daily basis, but sometimes you need to move them. The heat inside the vehicle can easily dehydrate the poor thing. Medications are another thing you shouldn't keep in the car for too long. The constantly changing temperatures inside the vehicle can decrease the effectiveness of your pills. Authorities recommend keeping most medications at 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit in a cool and dry place. Important documents that contain your personal data shouldn't be left in the vehicle either. Some examples of such documents are tax forms, financial statements, and school transcripts. A thief could commit fraud or identity theft using this valuable information. And there's also food and drinks. Experts recommend not leaving groceries or leftovers in a warm car for more than two hours or only an hour when it's over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The same rule applies in the winter too. Canned foods, for example, have a high risk of going bad if a can of sweet peas, let's say, gets frozen in the car. The effect will be similar to what would happen to soda. Let it thaw in the refrigerator instead of leaving it at room temperature. If the product doesn't look or smell normal, throw it away in a place where not even an animal can find it. Don't try to taste it, just trust your senses. If the item seems rusted or there are some cracks in the can, it should end up in the trash too. Eggs are another example. Normally, eggs shouldn't be frozen. But let's suppose you forgot one grocery bag in the trunk of the car and the weather was so cold at night that the eggs got frozen. Keep the eggs in the refrigerator before use. They should be hard cooked. It's your only option. You see, freezing causes the yolk to become thick and syrup-like. It loses that natural flow and doesn't mix well with other ingredients. You shouldn't leave your pets alone in the car, obviously. And not just because of a potential rise in temperature. They will feel uncomfortable without you, their best friend accompanying them. In their frustration, they might do something to get noticed, which can be, for example, ruining the interior of the vehicle. Now let's return to the winter season again. If possible, keep the gas tank of your car over half full. This can prevent the fuel lines from freezing. 
It also makes it easier to start the engine and hit the road in the morning. While keeping an eye on the fuel bar, it might be a good idea to glance at the tire pressure too. The cold can result in tire pressure drops. Not only high, but also low temperatures can damage some items. A good example is paint cans. They should be quickly taken out of the vehicle in the winter. The ingredients in the paint can experience expansion, separation, and clumping due to the cold. In other words, you won't be able to use this paint anymore. Weather also affects wooden musical instruments like violins or guitars. Changes in temperature and humidity can cause wooden instruments to warp, crack, or split. Glasses get affected by fluctuating temperatures too. In a hot car, plastic frames can bend. Or plastic can become brittle when it's very cold. This makes glasses prone to breaking. Don't leave house keys and garage door openers inside the car. This is an everyday practice for many people, but it's risky. They can get into the wrong hands. To listen to music, most people connect their phones to the car or listen to the radio. CDs are getting less and less used these days, but don't leave them in the car anyway. They might get warped, and you won't be able to use them anymore. Can you think of any other items you shouldn't leave in the car? You're relaxing at the beach when suddenly you notice a huge flock of birds. They're excited about something near the water. You get the urge to go and investigate what's going on there. Here's some advice. Sit back down and stay away from the water. I get it, you think you're tough enough to handle a few pecks from a seagull. But it's not the birds that have me worried, it's what's lurking beneath the water. Fish are a staple of many diets across the animal kingdom, both above and below the ocean. Tuna, squid and octopus, as well as marine mammals like seals, all prey on a wide variety of smaller fish. Species such as bluefish and striped bass are their favorite dinnertime meal. They're also the favorite of another ultra predator, which is why you shouldn't join those birds by the water. If you do, you're risking an encounter with a creature that can measure up to 20 feet long. That's three times the size of an average human. These are the size credentials of a great white shark. If there are fish around, they may come up near the ocean surface to feed. A great white shark has the strongest bite force among animals. The only other animal species that comes close to them is the saltwater crocodile. And boy is their ability to catch whiffs strong. Scientists believe it to be more than 100 times stronger than a human's. They don't even use the nostrils located beneath their snouts to breathe. It simply serves as a specialized sniffer. Thankfully though, we're not the favorite meal of a shark and the creature isn't going out of its way to hunt us. Researchers claim that the odds of being attacked by a shark are as low as 1 in 3.7 million. When unfortunate meetings between sharks and humans do happen, a shark may mistake a human for a seal or an extremely large striped bass. This is why you should stay away from those birds and fishes and just let the other animals animal. You just focus on catching a tan in that sun chair. So, I guess this means that sharks have poor vision? Not quite. Their vision in clear water is up to 10 times better than that of humans swimming in the same environment. The structure of a shark's eye is quite similar to that of our own. It consists of a cornea, lens, retina, deep blue iris, and the pupil. Their eyes have two types of photoreceptors, rods and cones, just like humans. Although we're not too sure how well rods and cones perform for sharks, research has shown that they possess only one type of cone. It means they most likely don't have full color vision like a human. This might explain why they can sometimes mix humans up with other creatures. But hey, who's ever really fully focused when they're about to devour their dinner? Shark eyes also have tapitum lucidum. This is a layer of mirrored crystals located behind the shark's retina. These crystals allow the shark to see quite well in extremely dim light and murky water. The crystals reflect incoming light, which gives the rods inside the retina a second chance at detecting light that they might have missed the first time around. Fun fact, cats also have tapitum lucidum. 
This is why your cat's eyes glow in the dark when you shine a light on them. Another telltale sign that sharks may be hovering around in nearby waters is the presence of whales. Sharks have been known to stalk the creatures for over 100 miles. They'll follow pods waiting for one of the members to become vulnerable before expertly striking. So, lesson learned? If you now see birds by the water, it's probably not a good thing. Unlike when you see thousands of birds flying together through the sky. This is known as murmuration. You can see thousands of starlings unite together in the sky, moving in unison, dipping and swerving at the same time. It's like they're competing in some sort of synchronization event at the Bird Olympics. This happens when the birds begin to roost. It can be as early as September in some places and as late as the end of November elsewhere, with more birds joining the nightly displays during this time. Are they doing it for our entertainment? Well, not really. Grouping together in the sky offers protection from predators, like falcons. It can also get cold when you're flying that high up. So, the birds gather in their thousands to keep warm and exchange information on potential feeding sites. Okay, so in this case, a huge group of birds doesn't mean anything evil. But if you ever see some flying towards you whilst in a wooded area, it's probably time to leave the area. Birds and other animals flee wildfire areas. Certain mammals, like amphibians, may actually stay in the fire. Instead of fleeing for their lives, they will dig underground to escape it. But nearly all other animals will try their best to leave. Oh, and don't forget to jump out of the way whilst all those animals are running towards you. Why don't we switch back from birds to sharks? Yes, we now know if there are birds near the ocean surface, then sharks will probably be quite close as well. But what if there are no sharks anywhere near at all? If you ever happen to be in the ocean and notice some sharks heading deep towards the bottom of the ocean, this may be a sign that a hurricane or a tropical storm is on the way. Sharks can sense the drop in barometric pressure that accompanies the storm, so they could be trying to get out of the hectic zone. Sharks don't quite care for humans, so they don't view our sandy beaches and inland towns and cities as safety zones. They're quite intelligent creatures and know the deeper they go in the ocean, the safer it gets. But the ocean's not always the best place to go in an emergency. Case in point, if you come across sea creatures who usually live in water randomly resting on the sand, don't get inside the water. This is a sign that the water is potentially toxic. It's possible that a red tide is congregating in the water near the beach. Red tides happen all over the world but one algae species causes them in the Gulf of Mexico. A red tide occurs when the water is full of more toxic algae than normal. It can make the water reddish or brown, but sometimes the water's color is normal. If you go in the water, you might experience respiratory irritation like coughing or an itchy throat. If this happens to you, you should thoroughly rinse your mouth with fresh water. Speaking of water, Frogs are famous for their croaking, but if you've ever heard them do it a lot more than usual, it might be because it's about to rain. One theory says that this might have to do with their mating. They first do it, then lay eggs in bodies of fresh water. A good rain means more watery real estate for the frogs. That's why male frogs invite the ladies for a date before the showers with a croaking symphony. If you hear a lot of buzzing around, meaning the bees are more active than usual, a storm could be on the way. When they feel like it's approaching, bees start working even harder and faster to collect more nectar before the storm. And once they're done with it, they'll always come back to the hive 10 to 15 minutes before the heavy rain, even when there are no obvious signs of it. Their secret is super sensitive hairs on their back that can pick up electrostatic buildups from storm clouds. So, you're getting ready for your adventure in the land of ice and fire. But before you switch your phone to volcano explorer mode, hear me out. You need to pack properly to get the most out of your trip. Now, never underestimate the Icelandic weather. It doesn't matter if you're going there in May or January. You can expect all seasons in one trip or even one day. If you're going in summer, pack both light and warmer layers and some good hiking boots. You'll definitely need a waterproof and windproof outer layer. 
don't be shy to bring an insulated winter jacket. It's always better to take them off than not have it and freeze. One more thing you need to know about the Icelandic summer is that between June 15th and June 30th, you can expect something known as the midnight sun. The sun doesn't set until after midnight, and even then, it barely goes below the horizon. So it looks more like the evening twilight. Unless your accommodation has extra dark and thick curtains, you might have trouble sleeping when it's so light outside. That's why it's a good idea to pack a sleeping mask. And for the daytime, you'll definitely need sunglasses and sunscreen. Or you could just pop by in December when it's only light for 4 hours and 7 minutes a day. Winter temperatures aren't as terrible as you might think. But the snow and wind coming from all directions make things worse. So focus on staying warm and dry. An insulated jacket, another warm layer or two, thermal pants, reflective waterproof pants to stay dry and noticeable in the snows, a good warm hat, oh, and sturdy boots will literally take you a long way. Ice cleats as an add-on will help you stay stable on icy terrains. Spring and fall are pretty short, just like my dad, and the weather is also super unpredictable. So the same set of items you'd pack for winter will do. Even if you're going to Iceland in the coldest weather, definitely pack a swimsuit. Iceland sea isn't the warmest in the world, but you'll need that swimsuit for outdoor pools and hot springs the country is full of. Since all the pools are heated with geothermal energy, they're always warm. The locals and tourists swim in all sorts of weather conditions. Yes, even in the snow. The Blue Lagoon is the most famous geothermal spa. It uses seawater coming from around 6,500 feet underground, and it comes with useful earth minerals. Once it gets heated up by a nearby geothermal plant, a mix of ocean and fresh water pours into a lava pool at a temperature of around 102 degrees Fahrenheit. It gets its postcard-worthy turquoise color from the silica in it reflecting sunlight. Definitely bring a reusable water bottle for the trip. You can refill it with tap water since it's perfectly safe and healthy. The country is full of pure springs and glaciers, and that high-quality water goes to every tap. There are zero chemicals in it, so it's officially some of the clearest kinds of water in the world. All you have to do is wait a bit when you change from hot to cold water. Hot water also comes to Icelandic homes straight from the spring and is heated by geothermal sources. The sulfur in it makes it smell like rotten eggs. Although it's yucky, it's totally harmless. Bottled water is overpriced and it literally comes from the same tap. Icelanders will have no problem speaking and understanding English. But if you want to feel more like a local, you could bring translation earbuds. Icelandic is pretty difficult to grasp on the go and might sound unusual. The language has less than half a million native speakers, but they're super proud of it, and it keeps growing. Instead of borrowing words from other languages for new concepts, they create new words or repurpose some old ones. The Icelandic for computer, for instance, totally translates as the number oracle. There are over 130 ways of saying wind, and 112 of them are written on a wooden walkway from the calmest to the strongest wind, just in case you want to learn them. There are also some concepts the English language just doesn't have. For example, this. Window weather. It's the kind of weather that looks good from the inside, but once you step out, you regret your decision. Makes sense to me. In case, for some reason, you were planning to bring a horse to Iceland, stop right there. The Icelandic horse is one of the oldest and purebred horses in the world, with a history of the breed going back to the 10th century. The story goes that the ancestors of today's beauties were carefully selected to be brought to Iceland from Norway during the Viking years. And no one has imported any other horse breeds to Iceland since the 11th century. It is banned by law. This complete isolation helps the Icelandic horses stay super healthy and live a long life. These beauties used to be the only form of transportation in the country. They've adapted to survive in all kinds of weather conditions and have grown, although they still don't look huge. And oh, when you see it, never call it a pony. It can offend the locals. Now, I don't want to be the one to tell you, but your wish won't come true just because you threw a coin in one of Iceland's thermal springs. The signs forbidding throwing coins are all over the place for a good reason. 
The coins keep hanging in crystal clear waters, ruining the natural look of geysers and pools. Plus, researchers have proved that coins and other trash can change the color of the thermal water for good. That's precisely what happened in Yellowstone. The Morning Glory pool changed its color from tropical blue to green with orange and yellow hues. If you don't want that to happen to the beautiful Icelandic landscapes, then keep the coins for souvenirs or in your pocket. Now, elves are a big deal in Iceland. About half of the population believes in their existence. The local folklore sees elves as the hidden people who live in the lava fields. When someone wants to build something in one of those, they have to take into account the elves' opinions. Yes, these guys have a spokesperson who comes to meetings. Sometimes road construction is even diverted around boulders where the elves live so not to disturb them. These little guys go house hunting during the winter holiday season. And it is 13 elves called the Yule Lads who bring the young generation of Icelanders their gifts. If you want to learn more about the elves during your trip, you can sign up for Reykjavik's Elf School. You'll get textbooks, a legit elf diploma, and tea with cookies as a bonus. They might seem like a regular photo prop, but these little pyramids of rocks actually have a name and history. The humans of the past used to build cairns to be used as kind of a GPS system long before the concepts of cars and GPS was even created. Travelers marked certain spots along their routes to help other wanderers find the path. They used to be the only way of marking the routes, and you can still find them all over the island. Iceland, of course, has GPS now, but it's illegal to move rocks from the cairns because they're considered an important part of history. Plus, some hikers still use those pyramids for navigation. So, if you randomly build one of those, hikers can easily get lost as they'd follow the wrong route. Oops! Now, if you want to bring a good gift to your new Icelandic friends, a book is a great idea. For many years, the country had the highest rate of publishing books per capita in the world. On average, 1 out of 10 Icelanders publishes a book in their lifetime. There's even a special book-giving holiday. Icelandic sagas go back to the 13th century. Writers create their sagas even on napkins and coffee cups. Each geyser and waterfall has its own tale about heroes and heroines attached to it. You can also scan barcodes on public benches to listen to audiobooks on your smartphone. Cool! You walk in the park and stop because you come across the cutest puppy. While admiring it, you notice a red collar, and remember, red is the universal sign for stop. All over the world, you see it on stop signs and stoplights. This cute pup is one you shouldn't get too close to. A red collar on a dog signals that the animal is aggressive and should be given space by humans and other animals. These dogs may be more likely to snap, bite, or lunge at any passersby. You may find this hard to believe given how happy the dog might look when you see it with its handler. You're right, it probably is delighted because it loves its owner and may also be super protective of them. It's also possible that the dog may be an assistance dog. However, these dogs should wear a vest with emotional support or assistance dog written on them. Oh, and please remember three important words. Do not pet. Not all dog owners opt to use color-coded language with their pets. It's often used more in professional environments. For example, if a dog and their sniffer are required for scent work, they probably have better things to do than getting belly rubs from strangers. The red collar might now serve as your fair warning. It's a fact that dogs have up to 300 million olfactory receptors in their noses. Humans have roughly 6 million. It means that their sense of smell is about 50 times better than ours. The part of a dog's brain devoted to analyzing smells is about 40 times greater than ours. Dogs are attracted to new odors. There's a good chance they'd prefer a sniffing session to your offer of a belly rub. It could just annoy them. Why don't we take a look at some other things that can irritate your dog? This first one might hurt your feelings and be hard to accept. Have you ever noticed your dog freezing in terror when you go to hug it? Have you ever wondered why? Dogs just don't like it when you hug them. Research has shown you should never constrain your dog, which is exactly what happens when you hug them. If your dog comes looking for it, then okay. But otherwise, a pat on the head will be enough. None of us like returning home to find our beautiful furniture chewed to pieces. 
or discovering that our brand new shoes are ruined. But one thing you shouldn't do is yell at your dog, even if they chewed your favorite and most expensive shoes. Yelling just confuses the dog. Dogs may simply think you're barking at them and start wondering what's happened to its human. I know those puppy eyes are beautiful and hard to look away from, but try not to stare at them for too long. Prolonged eye contact can be another form of aggression to our loyal companions. This even applies to your own dog, who may get spooked by your serious demeanor. This is especially true with strange dogs who may be anxious or uneasy with your presence. Try to distract yourself from looking at them by simply focusing on stroking that warm, cuddly fur. What else annoys your dog? Whilst your furry friend may be perfectly okay with having extremely oversized nails, one thing they're often not okay with is their owners trying to clip them. Research suggests that dogs hate getting their nails clipped, ears checked, and mouth examined. However, these things have to happen as overgrown nails could hurt your dog, and checking their ears could prevent nasty ear infections. It's good to get your dog comfortable with you touching their feet and ears before taking them to your local groomer or trying to cut nails yourself. Being a responsible dog owner is by making sure that they get enough exercise. And dogs always love a walk, right? Well, not always. Let's be practical about this. You're at the beach on a sunny day. You walk on the sand barefoot and suddenly you feel your feet burning. You quickly struggle back to your towel. See where I'm going with this? If it's too hot for your feet, it's probably too hot for your dog's paws. And it's not just burning feet you need to be worried about. The heat itself can harm your dog. Dogs can cool themselves by panting. However, this method is not too effective in hot weather. By moving your dog walking sessions to early mornings or late afternoons, you could be doing that puppy of yours a big favor. Variety is the spice of life, and don't think this doesn't apply to dogs especially when it comes to the games you play with them. When we think of games to play with our dogs, the best most of us can come up with is fetch. We're not the ones that have to desperately chase after the ball, so this is quite convenient. Be more creative. Try some other games, one of which is tug of war, which involves equal effort from both dog and human. Dogs love this game and contrary to popular belief, it has no connection to aggression especially if you alternate between who wins each round. This game will also teach your dog a vital skill in impulse control. Games that end early will teach your dog the difference between what's acceptable and what isn't. You can also play training games with your dog. Giving your dog a treat when they look at you without being asked to will enable you to have more control over them. Although they're animals, dogs do have some traits in common with humans. Example. They won't get along with everybody, so don't try to force a dog into a friendship with another dog. Some dogs are shy, whilst others are social butterflies. Our job as responsible pet owners is to find out how we can make our dogs comfortable. Dogs have different levels of confidence. One dog may be fine with another dog, but become uncomfortable in a group bigger than two. It's sometimes best to create a small group of dog friends for your dog to play with or just introduce them to new dogs one at a time. But forcing them into uncomfortable situations is a no-go. One thing we're all at sometimes reluctant towards is change. One thing that a dog loves to do is to make their owner happy. So if your dog's not listening to you, there's a good chance it's because your rules aren't consistent enough. Consistency is something that dogs love. It allows them to know how to behave in different situations. Telling them to lay down after previously using the word sit can cause major confusion. As a matter of fact, you should probably make a daily schedule for your dog. This will prevent your dog expecting a game of tug of war when you're trying to get ready for work. And one thing you need to put into the schedule is some time outside of the house. This will teach your dog how to behave in new environments. You can't just expect your dog to enter one of the many dog-friendly cafes that now exist and know how to be a good girl or boy. Take baby steps. If your dog becomes excited, you're moving too fast. Oh, and don't forget those yummy treats to reward your pooch for good behavior. With all of the attention our dogs pay to ourselves, it's only fair that we should try to do the very same with them. Not paying attention to your dog's body language isn't good. Just because they don't speak a language doesn't mean you can't tell what's going on inside their head. Research shows that dogs speak with their bodies. Although some behavior like leaning in for more attention are pretty universal, dogs have very different ways of showing their anxiety, from freezing in place 
to an odd tail wag. A dog's eyes, tail, and ears and posture are key to understanding how your pet is feeling. Paying close attention to how your dog responds to different social settings will also allow you to prevent any uncomfortable situations moving forward. The most obvious thing your dog doesn't like? Being ignored. Neither dogs nor humans have the energy to play all day, but time does need to be carved out of your schedule for some one-on-one -on -one bonding. Food and shelter isn't the only thing these creatures need. This is especially true when adding a new dog to your home. Dogs may also feel left out. Please make sure the older dog doesn't feel unloved. Let's see if you have already figured out the hidden secrets of these things. The little arrow besides the gas pump symbol on your dashboard. This might sound pretty obvious, but it's there to tell you which side your gas tank is on. No more taking hours to remember it. The answer is right in front of you. The winter season equals a lot of hot chocolate and beautiful coats. They say people dress better in winter. I certainly agree. When it gets chilly out there, I take out my warmest clothes. Have you ever wondered what the half belt on your favorite winter coat means? Nowadays, it's just there for an aesthetic function. But they were originally used to gather the extra cloth of jackets that doubled up as blankets. The belt was literally used to turn a blanket back into a jacket. Now, there's nothing more annoying than wearing your beautiful wool sweater and itching yourself through it. To keep this from happening again, here's the secret. Turn your sweater inside out and soak it in cold water. Add 2-3 to three tablespoons of vinegar and let it sit for some time. Drain the water. Now, while the sweater is still wet, massage a generous amount of hair conditioner into the wool fibers. After letting it soak in the hair conditioner for about 30 minutes, gently press the excess water out of the wool and leave it to dry flat on a towel. There you go! No more itchy sweater! It's Friday night and you have a couple of friends over for hamburger night. You take out that delicious Heinz ketchup to make it even yummier when the patty is done. Oops, the ketchup seems stuck. No matter how hard you punch the bottle, it won't come out. Your friend notices you and gives you a brilliant tip. Check out the 57 marking on your ketchup bottle. Not the one in the logo, that doesn't mean anything. But the one marked on the bottle indicates the best spot to squeeze to get your sauce out. It's Ketchupalooza, everyone! Women in men's shirts have buttons on different sides. If that ever confused you, here's the explanation. Shirt manufacturers back in the 13th century started to place women's buttons on the left side. Actually, buttons were a sign of wealth. Most people tied their clothes with strips of cloth. However, wealthier women had other people to dress them, such as chambermaids. Buttons on the left side made it easier for women to be dressed by other women. This style traveled through time, and manufacturers continue to do it until today. If you see cloudy ice on your drink, I would throw the whole thing out if I were you. Imagine you took a trip to your local pizza place. As you arrive, your mouth is watering just to think of the free soda refill you'll get. Mm -mm. While waiting for your pizza, you go to the soda machine. First things first, you fill your cup with ice to the rim. You notice the ice is a bit more cloudy than usual. Why is that, you think? Should you throw it all out and pour the soda in anyway? Depending on how you freeze your ice, it freezes from the outside in. The first thing to freeze is the cleanest water. Minerals and impurities get pushed toward the middle of the cube, making the ice cloudy. In this case, go for the clear ice cubes. Clear ice means it's only water. You're less likely to have any troubles there. It will taste better, and it will last longer, keeping your drink colder for more time. The air stuck inside the cube will evaporate, and impurities melt sooner than the actual water, leaving you with tiny cubes of ice. In case you need good news, commercial ice machines tend to make clear ice cubes. Hey, enjoy all you can drink! Keyboards weren't always organized the way they are today. The first keyboards were made for typewriters. And remember typewriters? Anybody? Hmm. They were organized in alphabetical order. The A was right beside the B and the C and so on. So why is the system we know and have today called QWERTY? 
Well, originally, if you type the keys too fast, the metal arms holding the letters would jam. The solution was to spread out commonly used letter pairs like ST. And the top row ended up with the letters QWERTY, which allowed typists to actually type faster with far fewer jams. Still used today. If you grew up off-roading, you're probably used to seeing jerry cans around. They're super important when the gas in your tank is running out and you are hundreds of miles from the nearest gas station. They can carry up to 5 gallons of fuel. But have you ever wondered why jerry cans have three different handles? This particular feature was designed thinking about how heavy carrying fuel can get. If you're alone, use the middle handle. It will distribute the weight better. But if you have an extra pair of hands, you can grab a handle on either side and carry it around. And would also mean that you're a mutant. Let's give him another hand. The little pocket inside women's underwear is not really a pocket. It's called a panty gusset. It consists of an extra fabric that is sewn in for hygienic purposes. But most manufacturers don't want to spend that extra buck sewing both ends of the fabric. So it turned into a pocket. And that's all I have to say about that. Meanwhile, did you ever check the inside of a soda cap? The glass bottle caps come with a special feature, a clear plastic liner. And no, they were not invented only to hand out prizes and reward codes. These plastic liners serve the purpose of keeping your drink fizzy. They're responsible for keeping the carbon dioxide inside the bottle. Way to go, whoever thought of that. I love me some fizzy drinks. Now, if you're ever in the need of pot scrubbers, try this. Whenever you buy oranges at the supermarket, don't throw their mesh bag away. Keep it and make your own pot scrubber. You just need to tie it up and it's ready. It'll work great on your dishes and clean those dirty pots and pans. Now, say you're out in public and need to use the restroom. Do you know which way those paper seat covers should go? Most of us place them backward, because I think this subject never came up at school. But they are actually made to go toward the front. This way, it prevents the cover from dragging along all those germs. Don't throw empty glass bottles away. Keep the ones with longer handles to water your plants. You just need to fill them with water and put them upside down into a planter. Push it gently into the soil and leave it there. The water will transfer into the pot as the soil becomes dry. Suitable for everyone who keeps forgetting to water their house plants. Another pro indoor gardening tip. To keep the water from leaking at the bottom of your plants, use a coffee filter. Place it in the bottom of your pot before adding the dirt and the plant. The filter will keep water from spilling out of the pot. Bread tie color guide. Try memorizing this before your next trip to the supermarket. Now, maybe you've noticed before, but bread bags carry little tags with different colors. Each tag color indicates the day of the week the bread was made. This helps store owners and consumers know how fresh the bread they're buying is. Monday is blue, Tuesday is green, Thursday is red, Friday is white, and Saturday is yellow. Sunday? Well, the baker needs a day off. Can you resist the power of bubble wrap? Most people are highly seduced by bubble wrap, making it impossible to stay around it for long periods. But did you know that bubble wrap was not invented initially to wrap things? A team of engineers and an inventor were trying to develop a textured wallpaper. They tried sealing two shower curtains together to capture air bubbles and give the wallpaper a raised surface. But the public didn't buy that idea. It wasn't until years later that they understood that bubble wrap was a perfect packaging material. Can we have a round of applause for this timeless invention? Or better yet, some bubble wrap pops? Hmm. On the outside, the surface of this lake looks like the aftermath of a disaster. Empty tree trunks spike out of the turquoise waters. The lake is surrounded by mountains, making it a quiet but unsettling place. But those who dare to swim under these dangerous waters will soon discover a whole new world. This isn't the beginning of a fairy tale. It's the actual story of Kayindi Lake, located in Sati, Kazakhstan. Back in 1911, an earthquake caused a major landslide in this location. The valley created eventually filled up with rainwater, practically submerging the forest. The trees that are located above the waters might look very sad, but beneath the surface, they remind you of an underwater forest. Since the waters are crystal clear most of the time, you can still see this fascinating view even from its shores. 
The ice-cold water makes this lake so tricky and, at times, even dangerous. And don't forget about all the algae, plants, and submerged trees that can rapidly become risky obstacles. Hey, I enjoy a steamy hot bath, but this boiling lake I'll tell you about now is really the stuff of scary dreams. It's located on the Caribbean island of Dominica, and its waters have temperatures between 180 and 197 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's just around the edges, since no one has ever dared to reach the middle of the lake to measure its core temperature. It's true that the heat can go down from time to time, but you never know when these waters may start to boil again. The place is also dangerous because of the gases it releases, such as carbon dioxide. It doesn't smell nice, trust me, but that's mostly because of the sulfur stuck in the steamy air. This seemingly calm lake also carries a dangerous surprise. Lake Manan, located in West Province, Cameroon, it's one of the few erupting lakes on the whole planet, similar to a volcano. And most of the time, it does so without any warnings. Its last eruption dates back to 1894, when it caused serious damage. The chemical mechanism of such lakes works like a can of soda that you shake before opening. There are risky gases on the bottom of the waters, so any disturbance on the surface may trigger their eruption. Natron Lake in Tanzania may be beautiful to watch because of its unique reddish coloring, but it's definitely not a place you'd want to take a swim in. While the water is extremely salty, it also combines with algae, which, by the way, are responsible for the coloring. And that's not even the riskiest thing about it. Natron Lake has pH levels so high that they become corrosive. If you dampen a piece of dyed material in this lake, it'll soon be stripped of its color. These high levels of acidity can also cause serious problems to the human skin. It's not all bad for some creatures, as Lake Natron is the only home to over 2.5 million small flamingos. These acidic and brackish waters support their survival, so it's no wonder they like to stick around. Lake Nicaragua's danger factor has less to do with chemistry and more to do with its inhabitants. It's located on the border of Costa Rica and Nicaragua and is the largest freshwater lake in Central America. When you first look at it, you won't think it can be dangerous. But because of the bull sharks inhabiting it, I wouldn't recommend taking a swim. Sharks tend to be unpredictable and at times intimidating creatures. Plus, they will eat everything if needed. Scientists initially believed this species of shark was only found in this lake. But they soon discovered that people had seen the same sharks in the Caribbean Sea. These astonishing creatures not only cross a distance of over 120 miles to get here, but can also adapt to freshwater, something not all fish can do. Belize's Great Blue Hole may seem alluring to divers. I mean, it has a gorgeous deep blue color and is pretty close to the mainland, about 62 miles. The problem is that beneath the surface of these tranquil waters is a mixed-up series of tunnels which contain many types of coral and other wildlife. These caves are what makes diving through the Great Blue Hole tricky. More so, specialists discover that deeper into the waters there are fewer and fewer creatures. Why? Because of a hidden layer of hydrogen sulfide that spans over the whole width of the sinkhole. Since there's no oxygen, no creature can ever survive this deep into the hole. Lake Lanier is the largest lake in the state of Georgia. It has a lot of visitors each year, about 11 million, so that's about the same number as visiting the Louvre Museum in Paris. Despite its popularity, a lot of accidents happen on this lake, and nobody knows for sure why. One of the explanations may lie beneath the surface of this mysterious lake. There's a lot of debris and rubble in there, along with random objects that have been tossed in, like boats, lawn chairs, and even fishing wire. All this creates a tricky underwater obstacle course. With the added low visibility on the surface of the lake, this place can become risky to navigate. Another one of those lakes that looks like someone might have overdone with editing is the Grand Prismatic Spring, located in Yellowstone National Park, which stretches into the states of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Swimming here is completely prohibited. Why? It's 189 degrees Fahrenheit in the center, almost close to boiling temperatures, and the outermost ring reaches around 131, hence the colors. Since the center of the water is way too hot for any life to make it, there's nothing clouding the surface. 
The lack of any living organisms here creates that vivid blue that looks almost painted over. On the small Mediterranean island of Cyprus, there's not a lot of rain during the summer. That's why some bodies of water here become so dry that in certain areas, they get covered in a layer of baked salt. It's the case for the Larnaca Salt Lake. Now, don't be fooled by the eerie landscape. These lands can easily become a trap. That's because it's easy to get confused about what's actually a dry surface and what's just a thin layer of salt on top of water or mud. More so, underneath the crust are salt crystals, which can cause problems for people's skin. Samisen Hole is one of the most dangerous places to swim in the whole of Thailand. It's because it's very deep, reaching 280 feet, and gets extremely dark. At certain points, as divers get lower, they can even reach places with zero visibility. No wonder a lot of people get confused and can't seem to find their way up anymore. The largest lake in Africa, and the third largest lake in the entire world, is called Lake Victoria. Not all of its waters are unsafe for people, but some regions can rapidly cause problems. Why? Particularly because it has its own isolated weather system, and that makes the weather really unreliable. It can go from bright and sunny to terrible in a matter of seconds. I mean, who would want to get caught swimming in the middle of a storm, right? Pustoyi Lake is located in Siberia, so I'm guessing I don't need to tell you the waters here get extremely cold. But if you look at the lake, there's nothing out of the ordinary with these waters. Hmm, is that completely true? Eh, most likely not. And people tend to avoid swimming here at all costs, even if they can resist the freezing cold waters. So what makes Lake Pustovi so mysterious and dangerous? Well, nothing seems to want to live here, and scientists have yet to discover why. They tried to fill the lake with many types of fish and various plant species to see if they could survive in the waters, but the results were hmm, disappointing. Since we don't know exactly what makes it so difficult to survive here, don't go running for your swimming trunks just yet. It's best if you stay away. Hey, you don't have to tell me twice. Are you used to picking up hitchhikers on your long commute to work? You might want to hear about the hitchhiker road scam. This trick preys on unsuspecting drivers. The scam typically starts with a person posing as a hitchhiker, who flags down a car on the side of the road. They may claim to be stranded or in need of a ride to a nearby town or city. In some cases, the hitchhiker may ask the driver to pull over at a specific location, such as a gas station or convenience store, where they will then disappear with the driver's money or other valuables. This scam can also be done in groups, where a bunch of people will flag down a car and ask for a ride. And once the car is on the move, they will threaten the driver and steal money, valuables, or even the car itself. It's important to be aware of this scam and to always be cautious when picking up hitchhikers. It's best to avoid giving money or other valuables to anyone who claims to need a ride and to never pull over at a location that is not safe or familiar. Hitchhikers are not the only reason why you might get into trouble on the road. A slice of cheese isn't something you'd expect to find on your parked car, am I right? Well, it might indicate something quite dangerous. One woman told the story of such an experience online, thinking it was just a prank made by some neighborhood youngster. She decided to call a friend and ask for help with cleaning the car up. But once the two ladies started rubbing off the melted cheese from her windshield, they saw something strange nearby. She remembered seeing a white van arriving. In it were a bunch of men suspiciously staring at them. She wasn't alone, so she decided it was safe enough to finish cleaning up the car, even though they didn't feel comfortable being stared at. It took them almost an hour to scrape off the cheese that had melted under the heat. She did wonder, though, if this wasn't a tactic to rob a person. That's because most people would be so focused on cleaning up the mess on their car, they'd be distracted from keeping an eye on the thing they left in the car, like bags, wallets, or even recent shopping items. Or worse, what if it was a kidnapping strategy? That sticky cheese would keep a person really concentrated on fixing the car, so they wouldn't be able to see suspicious people coming at them in due course. The key takeaway from this story, if you ever see a piece of cheese on your car, might as well leave it as it is. 
as long as it's not blocking your view and it doesn't really affect your driving. Your safest bet is to just clean it at home or take it to the nearest car wash. They'll know the best way to clean up the vehicle without ruining the paint. Sure, the piece of cheese on a car scam might just be a coincidence, but some scams out there are more legitimate, with this next one being quite the unusual method when it comes to snatching away other people's cars. If you notice a t-shirt or a hoodie on your windshield, or even wrapped between your wiper blades, don't be so quick to take it away. Again, it can be placed there on purpose to distract you while your car gets taken away. Drive away as quickly as possible if you can, and get to a safe location that's well lit and filled with many people. There you can remove whatever object you have on the car without any risks. Some people have even found money under their wiper blades. It's easy to imagine that those who left it there probably had the same intention in mind. There are methods to help when it comes to decreasing your odds of getting your car snatched away. Keep your tires turned to the curb whenever you park it. If your car wheels are in that position, thieves are less likely to be able to move around with the vehicle. They'll see that your car requires more time and energy to be moved, so it'll become less of a target. Sadly, scams on the road are quite common. And one of the most widespread types is the infamous tow truck scam. This scam involves leaving oil, metal nails, or glass shards on the road and waiting for drivers to fall into the trap. If your car gets damaged in such a situation, the scammers will suddenly appear out of nowhere and offer to provide towing service at extremely high prices. They'll try to pressure you into using their services because most of the time, they place these traps in strategic locations. They make sure people get stranded where there's low visibility and no gas station in sight where you can assess the damage done to your car. In a situation where you have no other option but to give consent for them to tow your car, they'll also take advantage of the situation and take it to workshops unapproved by your insurance company. This means you'll have to pay even more money to get your car back. If you've been a driver for long enough, you know that the driver who rear-ends another vehicle is always at fault. That's because you should always keep a comfortable distance from the car in front of you, so you can safely stop the car in case of an emergency. Some scammers will take advantage of this by repeatedly braking suddenly, causing you to hit them. This dangerous tactic is used to get money for supposed damages and even for make-believe medical expenses. To avoid falling victim to this scam, you should reduce your speed and keep a safe distance, especially from suspicious vehicles or chaotic drivers. If a scammer continues to bother you in traffic, the best course of action is to drive to the nearest police station and report them. Picture this. You're driving on the road and suddenly a motorcyclist gets your attention and points out that your wheels are smoking. You quickly pull over to the side of the road. The motorcyclist then offers to help by calling a mechanic to check your wheels. Surprisingly, the mechanic gets there really fast but proceeds to disable your braking system while inspecting the cause of the smoke. He then asks you to test your brakes which of course won't be working since he's already disabled them. Pretending to be helpful, mm -hmm. he offers to fix your brakes for you, but will charge an enormous price for it. Moral of the story, stick to your trusted mechanic or towing company. You never know who you'll find on the road. Some scams aren't even that. They're just urban legends. Many people claim to have seen the wrong way man on the roads. One version of this story mentions a man stuck driving down one-way streets in the opposite direction, causing chaos and confusion as other drivers try to avoid him. The man is said to be crazed and dangerous, with a wild look in his eyes and a penchant for reckless driving. Other stories say he's not even driving, but that once you've seen this mysterious person on the side of the road while driving home, you should turn around to keep from going back to your house for at least a week. That is, if you don't want anything bad to happen. There are countless stories of near misses and close calls with this mysterious figure. Some even say that they've been hit by the man and that they suffered serious injuries as a result. Despite the many sightings and stories, 
there's no concrete evidence to suggest that the wrong way man actually exists. Many experts believe that the legend is simply a cautionary tale, meant to remind people to be aware of their surroundings and to drive safely. However, the legend persists and continues to be passed down through generations, making it one of the most enduring urban myths of all time. Ah, a purple sunset. You must have seen one of those at least once in your life. Normally, it's nothing ominous and has to do with the way light travels. The light that the sun produces is white. When it goes through a prism, you see light waves of different colors, from red and orange to blue, green, and indigo. Light normally travels in a straight line if there's no obstacle in its way. The shorter light waves, including blues and purples, are scattered easier when they meet with those obstacles, like molecules and aerosols in the atmosphere. Because the sun is low on the horizon at sunset and sunrise, its light has to pass through more molecules that scatter the violet and blue light. The colors that your eyes pick up, then, are yellow, orange, and red. But with the right conditions, you can see the gorgeous purple sky. Sometimes purple sky appears for much scarier reasons. It can be caused by hurricanes, wildfires, or dust storms. The concentration of vapor in the air increases, and the light scatters more than usual. Dust, a setting sun, and low cloud cover all contribute to this natural show, too. The sky turns orange and red at dusk if there's still enough light. Then it gives off pink hues, which mix up with a dark blue sky above. Now, do you remember what happens when you mix pink and blue? You get the color purple. Not every hurricane makes the sky turn purple, and trying to predict if it's going to happen is like trying to forecast a rainbow. Still, people reported several major hurricanes made the skies turn purple. Now, green skies might look just as spectacular as purple ones, but they actually also scream danger. They're usually there to tell you a thunderstorm, hailstorm, or a tornado is somewhere nearby. The unique color is a result of yellow sun rays getting mixed with the blue light coming from storm clouds. So you're enjoying a nice day by the ocean with a fresh breeze in your hair, when suddenly you notice the water starts retreating from the beach at a huge speed. This is a sign for you to start running as fast and far away from the beach as you can. This most likely means that a tsunami is on the way. A quick reaction maximizes your chances of survival. Now, if you notice the sea level is rising, but it doesn't seem too extreme, it could be another sign of an approaching tsunami. It happens in 40% of cases, and the incoming water is the first tsunami wave. The next one, way larger and more dangerous, usually follows in about 10 minutes. Another thing about tsunamis is that they like to arrive with some loud sounds. People describe them as thunder, the sound of a locomotive, a helicopter, or just a loud boom. Do you see a channel of choppy water on the beach? It's in your best interest to stay away from the water. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange break in the waves or an area with a different color than the rest of the water. Random bits of seaweed going in all directions is another rip current warning sign. If you happen to find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat, but don't try to go against the current. You'll only waste precious energy. Scream for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the current, swim diagonally to the shore. The next time you spot conically shaped clouds in the sky, remember it's a good time to start looking for some shelter. If it just stays like that, a severe storm is on the way. But if a cloud of that shape starts spinning around, it means it's about to transform into a tornado. If you have bees nearby, they can save you from big trouble one day. These hard-working little guys get more active than usual when they feel like a storm is on the way. They speed up to collect more nectar before it hits them. And once they're done with it, they'll always come back to the hive 10 to 15 minutes before heavy rain, even when there are no obvious signs of it coming. Their secret is super-sensitive hairs on the back that can pick up electrostatic buildups from storm clouds. For centuries, 
people have noticed that animals act weirdly a couple of days before big seismic events. Dogs can't start barking, cows halt their milk, and toads, rats, and snakes leave their homes. It looks like animals can feel smaller initial shock waves that humans don't even notice. Scientists have tried to find some legit explanation for it and run endless tests and experiments. But so far, they're still on their way to explaining this mystery. Can you smell ozone in the air? When a thunderstorm is on the way, it's the most distinct and pungent smell you can pick up. An electrical charge of lightning sets it free from higher altitudes. The other, more pleasant smell of rain is petrichor. Rainwater wakes up molecules on plants, trees, concrete, and asphalt. Their aroma spreads all over the place. You can even feel that smell in your own mouth. All those positive ions in the air that a lightning bolt sets free gets mixed with ozone and your saliva. And that's how you get that bitter, metallic taste. When lightning is about to strike, you might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your palms may begin to sweat, and then you can feel your hair stand on end. That's a clear call for action, and that action is to run for your life. Positive charges are going through your body, trying to reach toward the negatively charged part of the storm. Trust me, you don't want these charges to meet. If you see no shelter that you can reach fast, try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. Drop down your umbrella and stay away from wire fences, metal pipes, rails, and other metallic objects. And don't lie flat on the ground, it's likely wet, which means it's a great conductor of electricity. If you suddenly notice crevices in the asphalt next to your house, it could be a sinkhole warning sign. Inspect your house on the inside. Does that door begin to jam? Or maybe there's a gap where the walls meet the ceiling. Uneven kitchen cabinets and drawers, slanted floors, stairs that begin to slope, water leaking after every rain, and displaced moldings are all signs that a sinkhole is about to open. To find out if it's definitely a sinkhole and how dangerous it is, you gotta consult with an engineering company. If you find a sinkhole that's already there, you gotta stay away from the sinkhole area. Fence or rope it off to make it less dangerous for others you'll need professional help to fix it. Some volcanoes scream when they're about to erupt. Small earthquakes, which often happen before, produce a hum. It's mostly non-audible to human ears, but sometimes it reaches a frequency that lets you hear it as a strange rumbling or hissing sound coming from the ground. This noise is known as a harmonic tremor. With some volcanoes, it's the sound of magma bubbles vibrating when they're going through crevices in the crust of the Earth. But it's not always like this. If scientists manage to understand what exactly causes these volcanic streams, they could create a limited early warning system for volcanic eruptions. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If its level is quickly falling, even if it's raining, this might be a sign of a nearing landslide. And if you hear a faint rumbling noise or unusual sounds, like boulders knocking together, it could mean debris is on its way to you. It's a sign to head to safety immediately, like right now. Now, flying has long become routine for many people. But even frequent flyers sometimes don't know about things you should never do on a plane. Ooh. No bare feet on a plane. It's one of the biggest no-nos of air travel. Even if we omit the topic of unpleasant odors, you, the airplane floor is extremely filthy. People with contagious foot problems might have been walking the aisles barefoot before you. There's likely to be a lot of dirt left after previous passengers. And don't even get me started on the floor in the laboratories. Ew. If your feet need some freedom, take off your shoes, but at least wear your socks or bring along a pair of light slippers. Keep in mind that the pressurized air in the passenger cabin is just as dry as it is in the Sahara Desert, with only about 20% humidity. That's why your skin may feel discomfort after a flight. Mm. But wouldn't it make more sense to install several humidifiers that could add some moisture? But this extra load would cost airlines lots of money. Plus, the plane's airframe is mostly made of aluminum and other metals, and humid air could lead to corrosion. So, don't forget to bring a moisturizer and use it during the flight. 
always secure your tray table as soon as the plane starts moving on the tarmac, and never lower it during the takeoff and landing. It's a security measure, which ensures that you and the other passengers will have a clear pathway in case of an emergency evacuation. Also, keep your seat in an upright position during takeoff and landing. First of all, a reclined seat can seriously slow down an emergency evacuation, since it will block a person sitting behind. What's more, the more backward you're leaning, the harder it is to get into the brace position during an emergency landing. Now try to avoid snoozing during or right after takeoff and landing. For one thing, it's not the best thing for your health. The main problem is that the air pressure inside the cabin changes very quickly during these phases of the flight. This, in turn, affects the air pressure in your ears. It's important to be alert during this time to relax and open up your ears, for example by yawning or swallowing frequency. Chewing gum works for me. If you're sleeping, you can't do this, which can lead to permanent damage. And of course, there's a safety issue. Most accidents happen during takeoff and landing. If you're sleeping during these stages, you might not be alert and conscious enough if an emergency happens. Now, this next recommendation comes from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. According to them, you might want to skip on hot drinks on a plane. The water used to make tea or coffee doesn't come from bottles, it's regular tap water. And water tanks on airplanes are often old and full of bacteria. In 2004, there was a study which found that more than 12% of water samples contained harmful bacteria. But if you still decide to have a cup of hot beverage on a plane, never pour coffee or tea on your own. Flight attendants are trained to handle this task in crowded aisles of a moving airplane and won't accidentally burn you or other passengers. Now, it's probably better if you don't order Coke on a plane. The cabin pressure so low up in the air causes a lot of foam. For apparent reasons, flight attendants don't want to serve you a cup filled with froth. That's why they'll fill only half the cup, then wait for the bubbles to settle, and then finish pouring. That can take ages. Keep your air vent open. This way, you'll minimize the spread of germs. Planes have high-quality air filters. They'll catch up to 99% of all airborne germs, so you should be safe there. But make sure to wipe that tray table. With 8 times more bacteria than the toilet flush button, it's the dirtiest place on board. Another thing you should avoid is leaning your head on the window if you have a window seat. You never know who occupied your seat before you, and in any case, the glass is likely to be covered with germs. Say no to backless sandals and high heels on a flight. I do. There are very serious safety reasons for such a request. The first is that both these types of footwear make it very difficult to evacuate the aircraft fast. If you wear high heels, you will anyway have to leave them behind in case the crew is using emergency slides during an evacuation. The heels are very likely to damage the slide, so off they go. Now ask yourself, do you really fancy running away from the airplane barefoot? I'll answer that for you, nope. Instead, wear sturdy shoes with a solid sole. In this case, you won't find yourself standing on the hot tarmac or in the weeds without any footwear at all. Don't stuff heavy objects into overhead compartments. Your things may not stay inside during severe turbulence. And while falling out, they will injure you and other passengers. Ow! That's why if it feels difficult to lift something into the overhead compartment, better put it under the seat in front of you or elsewhere. Now, don't blame the pilots for the hard landing. When you experience it in bad weather, it might be intentional. If the runway is covered with water or snow, the plane has to touch down hard in order to break the water layer and prevent aquaplaning. Otherwise, the water can perform the role of a lubricant, and the plane won't be able to break or respond to any control. Deploying an emergency slide when there's no emergency is a bad, very bad idea. It can cause hour-long delays and cost airlines thousands of dollars to pack the undamaged slide back into its container. Why would someone do it? Apparently, some think it'll help them get off the plane faster. Well, they're an idiot. Don't be one yourself. Just keep in mind that it doesn't work this way. Don't ignore the instructions of the cabin crew to open window shades during takeoff and landing. This way, flight attendants can see what's happening outside, assess the situation, and act fast, organizing the evacuation. For example, if there's a fire outside one exit, they will redirect passengers toward another door. 
Avoid carrying spray deodorants or shaving cream in your carry-on baggage. Both these things tend to explode mid-flight and therefore aren't allowed on board the airplane. A much better idea is to choose stick deodorants. You also mustn't keep power banks in your checked luggage. And if you want to bring one on board, its capacity shouldn't be more than 20,000 milliamps. Besides, you shouldn't use them during the flight since they might catch fire. In general, lithium batteries are safe to use. But since they're high energy, they can catch fire if they're not treated with care, misused, or if there's a manufacturing fault. Such batteries have been the cause of quite a few fires on board airplanes, as well as during ground handling. Do not worry about airport scanners. They won't harm your health. Otherwise, airport employees wouldn't be able to stay near them without special clothing. Even when you're passing by a baggage scanner, the risk is minimal. And the last one. Don't act like a jerk on board. Behave yourself. I know you will. Also, never try to land a plane on your own. Nah, don't laugh. I'm not kidding. In movies, they often show us that something happens to the pilots and they can't land the plane. And that's when the main character, a very skillful person, starts their game. Unfortunately, it's close to impossible to do it in real life. Even if a person is a genius, is fond of computer simulators that match the real model of an aircraft 100%, and is ready to follow all the instructions from the ground, they're likely to fail due to one simple aspect – stress. It is true that there have been cases throughout history when amateurs landed smallish private planes after the incapacitation of a pilot. However, there has never been a case of a non-professional pilot landing a commercial passenger airplane. It's only in the movie. Have you ever seen a sea cucumber lying on a bed of sand and thought it looked like a blob? Well, these creatures may seem squishy and defenseless, but they actually have some fascinating strategies to keep themselves safe. Biologists uncovered chemical compounds with the help of which sea cucumbers protect themselves from predators and even from their own toxins. And guess what? These compounds might be useful for human health. When sea cucumbers feel threatened, they can expel thread-like parts of their bodies. These tubes immobilize predators in a sticky, toxic embrace. The toxicity comes from some chemical compounds commonly found in plants. Interestingly, these chemicals are much less common in animals, but sea cucumbers have evolved to use them to their advantage. The substances are also known for their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. They're already used in a bunch of industries, like cosmetics. But using these chemicals as a defense creates a big problem for sea cucumbers they need to avoid damaging themselves with their own toxins. It means their own cells can't contain cholesterol, the target that the toxins bind to and pierce. Instead, sea cucumbers have developed two kinds of cholesterol alternatives. It's a self-defense strategy, you see? If you can produce these toxic substances, you have to be able to not make yourself sick. Smart and cute as they are, Now you know not to touch a sea cucumber should you ever stumble upon one at the beach. Speaking of things you should avoid at the beach, let's move on to the marbled cone snail, a creature so unique and dangerous that it'll make your head spin. This one is quite the world traveler. It can be found all the way from the southern tip of India to Okinawa, Japan, and southeast to New Caledonia and Samoa. That's quite an impressive range. And it's not just where it's found that's interesting, it's how it hunts. This snail may be small, but it's a fierce predator. It loves to chow down on other snails and sometimes even its own kind. When it's hungry, it'll stick out its long white tooth and shoot a poison-laden harpoon at its prey. And if that doesn't do the trick, it'll attack its prey multiple times over, just to be sure. Talk about determination, right? Once the harpoon hits its mark, the prey becomes immobilized and its muscles begin to relax irreversibly. And when the prey is helpless, the snail can begin to munch on it. Where can you find this fearsome creature, you might ask? Well, it's found in fairly shallow waters, typically on coral reef platforms or lagoon pinnacles, as well as in sand, under rocks, or among the seagrass. Watch your step the next time you're out for a swim, just saying. On the bright side, 
Did you know that this snail's venom is being developed as a potential treatment for pain? Some of the chemicals found in this substance have been studied and they're showing promise. Who knew that this unusual predator could have a softer side too? Next on your list of creatures to avoid should be a little fish called the stonefish. Now you might think this sounds like a cute little pet rock, but let me tell you, it's not to be messed with. In fact, it's the most venomous fish in the entire ocean. These guys are masters of disguise, blending right in with their surroundings at rocky or muddy bottoms of marine habitats in the Indo-Pacific region. They're like the ninjas of the sea, waiting patiently for their prey to swim by before swiftly attacking and swallowing it whole. But here's the thing. You could easily swim right by a stonefish without even realizing it's there. Now, I know what you're thinking. I don't want to accidentally step on a stonefish. And trust me, you really don't. These guys have a lot of spines lining their backs, and they release venom when they're stepped on. Ouch! That venom can cause terrible pain, swelling, and damaged tissues. Not exactly a good day at the beach, if you ask me. But don't worry, the stonefish isn't out to get you. It uses its spines defensively, not offensively. So, as long as you're not disturbing it or stepping on it, you should be fine. Just be careful where you step and maybe invest in some water shoes. And if you do happen to get stung, seek specialized attention immediately. It's best to always look where you walk, shuffle your feet along the bottom to avoid stepping directly on the fish, and wear water shoes when you're in an area that could be home to stonefish. Have you ever had the pleasure of meeting a lionfish up close? They're such beautiful creatures with all those colors and fins that look like wings and accessories. It's easy to be mesmerized by their elegance, but don't be fooled by their stunning appearance. They're not to be messed with. In fact, they're one of the most dangerous fish in the ocean. If you get stung, you'll experience a lot of pain maybe even some allergic reactions. Lionfish inject venom through their needle-sharp dorsal and pelvic fins. They're not aggressive and won't sting you out of the blue, but they will act in self-defense if provoked or caught. It's not just their venom that makes them dangerous. They also have tiny teeth. But instead of using them to bite predators, they have something even more dangerous, their fins. The lionfish uses these spine-like fins to ward off predators. And unfortunately, that includes humans. So, while it might be tempting to swim up close to a fish and say hello, beware of its sharp spines. But here's the thing. Lionfish can be eaten. Some say they're actually quite delicious. And since they're a threat to reef ecosystems, human consumption is encouraged. Just make sure you remove the venomous spines first. If you're snorkeling or swimming near the corals in the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean, you might encounter these stunning fish. Keep a reasonable distance between you and the lionfish, and they won't feel threatened or startled enough to sting you in self-defense. Sea urchins might also cause some trouble if stumbled upon. Don't worry, they won't be jumping off the reef and flinging spines at you. They're not aggressive at all. These creatures are everywhere, from rocky shores to coral reefs, and are quite common in almost every body of salt water, including all of the world's oceans. So it's not surprising that sea urchin injuries are pretty common too. But hey, accidents happen, especially when we're distracted by a cute little turtle or too excited about exploring a new dive site. Now, let's talk about their defense mechanisms. These little guys have two ways of defending themselves, their spines and these tiny jaw-like structures that can inject a painful substance. Some species have long, sharp spines that can easily pierce even a thick wetsuit and lodge deep in your skin. Yikes! But don't worry, avoiding sea urchins is not rocket science. Just try to maintain a good awareness of your surroundings. Watch out for protruding spines in the sand and control your buoyancy. It'll help you stay at least a few feet away from corals, which may conceal urchins in their crevices. And if a shore entry has many urchins, pick a different dive site, no biggie. 
Now let's talk about first aid for sea urchin stings. Soaking the area in hot water for up to an hour and a half can break down the dangerous substance and alleviate the pain. Carefully remove the spines with tweezers and shave the area to remove those pesky spikes. Then wash the injured area with soap and rinse with fresh water. Apply topical creams if you have any in your beach bag too. And of course, watch for signs of allergies and contact a specialist immediately if you notice something weird. But hey, let's not forget that sea urchins are just one of many hazards of the deep. There are bearded fireworms, pufferfish, and fire coral too. So let's not be too hard on our little urchin friends. After all, compared to some of these other creatures, they're pretty tame. In the heart of a dense forest, a person embarks on a forest hike, delving into the hidden depths of nature's playground. But this isn't your ordinary stroll through the trees. It takes a turn towards an eerie and spine-chilling discovery. Our protagonist, with a twinkle of curiosity in his eyes, discovers a burrow hiding in the shadows. Curiosity outweighs mm -hmm. fear, and our explorer comes up closer. It's not some random burrow. This one belongs to a fox. So what if it's the wrong move and they should just run away? In the joyful season of spring, when nature comes alive with vibrant energy, foxes engage in their intricate dance of life. It's during this time that foxes seek solace in their underground sanctuaries. Throughout the rest of the year, when the world around them flourishes, foxes prefer to bask in the sun, finding comfort above ground, except when the weather takes a turn for the worse. It's in the most inclement conditions that they seek refuge in their burrows, shielding themselves from the elements. These burrows, known as fox earths, typically consist of only a few entrances, occasionally covered with scattered soil and debris. During winter months, industrious foxes diligently dig additional burrows in anticipation of the forthcoming spring. Sometimes, among the remnants of their subterranean journeys, lie the remains of fallen foxes, a testament to the cycle of life within these intricate underground networks. If one were to explore the vicinity of a fox earth, one would notice fresh traces of food remaining outside the burrows during the months of April to June. It's during this period, when playful fox cubs grace the earth with their presence, that remnants of their feasts can be found, a delightful sign of life unfolding. So what do these earths look like? After all, there are other animals with dens in the forest too. Now let's get to the heart of the matter. Fox dens, the elusive abodes of these mischievous beings, tend to be located in areas abundant in lush greenery. You might find these creatures hiding beneath the sheltering branches of a tree or seeking refuge beneath imposing rocks. If you stumble upon a cozy little hole that appears tailor-made for a fox and you catch a whiff of that unmistakable aroma accompanied by other intriguing clues like scattered bones, you've likely discovered a fox den. Alas, my curious friend, there's no foolproof recipe for where these sly foxes choose to build their dens. They possess an uncanny ability to adapt to diverse environments, be it open grasslands, dense forests, or even the unforgiving tundra. Picture this, a fox's den consists of a minimum of four to five sections. We have the grand entrance, the ever important ramp, the main den itself, and a secret room that doubles as a food stash. Depending on the size of the pack, there might be additional rooms to accommodate the whole gang of foxes. Mm -hmm. Now imagine the grand opening to a fox's den. The entrance and the ramp form a corridor leading about three to eight feet deep into the earth, connecting the outer world with the cozy haven within. Ah, but there's more. Foxes, being savvy planners, stockpile their foraged treasures in their dens. Yes, they have their own food caches where they hide all their scrumptious finds. The number of rooms within the den may vary, adapting to the size of the pack as these crafty creatures ensure there's enough space for giving birth and raising their adorable offspring. 
They might even dig extra tunnels and create additional entrances just to keep things interesting. Now let's talk about culinary affairs. Foxes are savvy gourmands who store food in large quantities, ready to weather the winter and the mating season. However, they're not extravagant hoarders. They usually stash away just enough to last them a few days, considering they don't dine on fresh prey every single day. Berries and fruits often grace their storage chambers, while any delectable meat takes center stage in their culinary adventures. Curious about the proximity of fox dens to one another? Well, if the land is bountiful with abundant food and fresh water, you might stumble upon two or three fox dens within a 10 square mile radius. But if resources are scarce, oh, you might have to expand your search to cover a sprawling 20 square miles to find just one den. But the saga doesn't end there. Foxes, true to their resourceful nature, often have multiple dens. They maintain the primary den, mm -hmm. often known as the natal den, which holds sentimental value. Additionally, they keep a backup den for some unpredictable circumstances. And let's not forget their knack for claiming abandoned or borrowed dens as their own. Such clever tricks, mm -hmm. aren't they? Now, let's talk about these marvelous creatures themselves. Foxes come in a delightful array of species, sizes, and variations scattered all across our planet. But the star of the show is the red fox, found on every continent except frosty Antarctica. While most foxes prefer the tranquility of rural landscapes, don't be surprised if they venture into the realms of urban and suburban dwellings, where their path might cross with humans. Ah, the encounters between a fox and a human. A tale of two extremes. Some kind souls attempt to win over these animals, offering them tidbits and coaxing them into their palms. On the other hand, there are those who tremble at the mere thought of a fox, fearing their crafty and ferocious nature. Now picture this scenario. What if a fox approaches you or launches an attack? Typically, foxes pose no threat to humans and harbor no ill intentions. They prefer to feast upon small mammals or livestock, reserving their aggression for hunting or self-defense. Yet, there have been reported cases of foxes crossing paths with humans, including incidents. Therefore, knowing what steps to take if a fox approaches or pounces on you is crucial. Foxes can indeed be domesticated, yet they remain wild at heart, and their actions can be wildly unpredictable. They might momentarily embrace their tamed side, only to snap back into their untamed instincts when feeling cornered, threatened, hungry, or simply scared. Naturally, foxes view us humans as potential threats, and it's in our best interest to reciprocate their cautious approach. Never attempt to approach a fox, even if it appears docile and friendly, as its temperament can shift within seconds, catching you off guard. Avoid sudden movements and resist the urge to inch closer, as doing so might agitate or frighten our fox friend. In most cases, when a fox spots a human nearby, it will swiftly scamper away or seek refuge in hiding. However, should you find yourself locked in a standoff with a fox, the best course of action is to take a step back and allow it the space it craves. Should a fox persist in its approach, or if you encounter several foxes nearby, my dear friend, give them a wide berth and allow them their space. Refrain from approaching or attempting to feed them, especially by hand. Let them carry on with their foxy affairs while you observe them from a distance. In a situation where a fox becomes trapped, such as finding its way into a room, I implore you to remain calm. Avoid raising your voice or causing unnecessary commotion, as it may provoke the fox to attack. Instead, remain silent, keep a safe distance from the creature, and provide it with an escape route. Ensure the doors and windows remain unobstructed, granting the fox the freedom it seeks. In due time, 
it will make its swift exit. However, if fortune frowns upon you and you find yourself in the unfortunate circumstance of a fox attack, remember to stay composed. Refrain from unleashing your pets or pursuing the fox. Just allow it to retreat on its own accord. If the fox persists and refuses to back down, a simple round of applause or a few claps might startle it away. Now you can enjoy the forest. You open up your mailbox and see a dryer sheet. It's got no purpose in there, so you take it out, right? Wrong. Leave it there. You'll be doing your mail carrier a big favor. Here's why. You might think dogs are the only creatures that cause problems to mail workers when they're out delivering your mail. And with good reason. More than 5,800 United States postal workers had unpleasant run-ins with dogs in 2020. But they aren't the only inconvenience for mail carriers who are just trying to get home safe. Mail workers often leave these dryer sheets in mailboxes to protect themselves against wasps. That might sound bizarre, but even the average person can expect to be stung by a wasp around five times in their life. And it's a much more likely occurrence than getting bitten by a dog. Why does the dryer sheet keep wasps away? Well, it's pretty simple, really. Wasps can't handle its smell. It's just way too intense for them, so they try to avoid dryer sheets altogether. It does make sense, given that dryer sheets are meant to freshen up our clothes and make them smell nice. One could expect them to have a strong scent. Overall, this is just a minor disturbance in the life of a wasp. Thankfully so, because they don't really have any time for extra worries. On average, wasps have an extremely short lifespan. Most will live no more than 22 days. This, of course, doesn't apply to the queen. That sometimes lives for as long as a full year. But it's still nice that, while the rest are here, they don't have to worry about flying into a dryer sheet everywhere they go. It's funny that the wasps that live for such a short period of time probably relate more to mail carriers who are trying to avoid them than their much-worshipped queen. This is because their 22 days of life are all about work. They each have their individual jobs, which ultimately revolve around building a suitable nest to ensure the protection of the queen. In this queen's nest, there are two different types of wasps, drones, which are males, and workers, which are females. The latter, in particular, are extremely diligent creatures. Worker wasps start their lives by helping to feed developing larvae. The larva is an immature insect, fresh out of an egg, which is yet to develop into its grown-up form. This stage of the worker wasp's life typically lasts for three to four days. After that, they begin to perform tasks that involve leaving the nest, such as collecting water or bringing back wood material, which is what nests are made of. The water they bring back is then spat out by the worker wasps and used to enlarge the entrance. The water mixes with the material that needs to be removed and forms pellets, which are then carried out of the nest. The worker wasp will then go through a period of focusing on building the nest itself before taking on the role of food gatherer. Wasps get energy from nectar or honeydew and protein from insects or animals. Speaking about the selfless nature of these worker wasps, they don't even have the necessary enzymes in their bodies to allow them to eat most of the food they gather. This means that the majority of the food they bring back goes to the undeveloped wasps known as larvae that I mentioned earlier. Thankfully, the worker wasps do get some kind of reward for their diligence. From the food the larvae digest, they can get a creamy substance that looks like soup. This substance contains all the sustenance that the worker wasps need to continue carrying out their duties. This type of food exchange is called trophallaxis feeding. It's a key part of the social contact between the workers and the developing young. On most of the foraging trips, the worker wasps travel up to 1,000 feet away from the nest. But research has shown that some journeys go on for over half a mile. The worker wasps even follow one another to known sources of food. The worker wasps finish their lives back inside the nest, but they don't relax and enjoy retirement. Instead, they take up their final role, which is guarding the entrance to the nest. So, how does the life of a female worker wasp compare with that of a male drone? Well, 
Their male counterparts are actually quite sluggish in comparison, even despite their larger size. The drones are, on average, over half an inch in length, whilst the female worker wasps are usually smaller than half an inch. The drones are also more brightly colored, have long drooping antennas, and don't have the ability to sting. The queen is bigger than both of those and is the closest to being a full inch in length. Why do I suggest the drones are lazier? Well, while the worker wasps are out collecting wood, water, or food, the drones can often be found back at the nest, putting their heads into empty cells with only their tails visible. Doing something to add value? Not really. It's more likely that they're just taking a nap. When they're not catching some shut-eye, they're known to help distribute food to the larvae by going from cell to cell and popping the meals into their open mouths. The drones also try to pull their weight in other ways, which, in a literal sense, wouldn't be hard to do since most drones and workers weigh between 10 and 19 milligrams. Anyway, the drones also carry away and dispose of any rubbish that may gather inside the nest. These nests, where the queen, drones, and workers coexist, typically last between three to four months. They fall apart in the winter when new queens fly away to hibernate. The rest of the wasps and the nest itself struggle to survive the cold winter conditions, as do the new queens. Research shows that as few as two out of every 4,500 queens make it through the hibernation period. This is not just because of the cold weather conditions. The queen wasps find dark and dry locations to hibernate, such as a crack in the wall inside a house. They tuck their antennae neatly between their legs and bite whatever surface is in front of them in order to hang on firmly. This leaves them extremely vulnerable to other insects, such as spiders. But those lucky queens who truly enjoy a nice long slumber during the hibernation period typically resurrect in the spring and begin to build a new nest. The queen will fly up to 47 miles just to find the perfect warm and dry spot. Attics and roofs often fit the bill. The queen will then produce new workers and drones, and the life cycle of wasps will continue. If you do come across a wasp nest, it's best to just leave it alone. You can't always know what kind of reaction you'll have to a sting from the creature. And who says you'll get stung by just one? The average wasp nest can hold up to 10,000 members during the peak of the summer. It's best to leave the nest to pest control services. But what precautions can you take to avoid any unfortunate encounters with wasps in general? We owe thanks to mail carriers for making us aware of dryer sheets. But what else can we do? You can start by not leaving any food lying around. This is the main attractor of wasps. Be it foods full of protein, like chicken, or sweets, like ice cream. Make sure you wash your dishes, cover any food you keep for later, and remove all leftovers as soon as you're done feasting. While wasps hate the odor of dryer sheets, things like flowers and fruits greatly please their sense of smell. You should pay attention to any perfumes, lotions, or hair care products that you use. Wasps may mistake them for nectar while out looking for food. You can also be practical about your defensive strategy against wasps. You can use your clothing to your advantage. Wear long sleeves and trousers. Stay away from sandals. You can avoid getting unnecessary attention from any nearby wasp by wearing red clothes, as it's the only color of the rainbow that they can't see. Most importantly, and I know it's easier said than done, so don't get mad at me for saying it, stay calm. Research has shown that waving your hands, panicking, and causing a commotion when a wasp lands nearby actually increases your chances of getting stung. I hope this will help you to protect yourself when you're around wasps. In the meantime, keep helping our great mail workers out and leave those dryer sheets exactly where they are. You're taking a stroll on a warm summer afternoon. The grass is green, the sun is in the sky, and suddenly, you feel yourself sinking. You begin to panic, but then immediately you bounce back up. You test your footing and jump slightly. The grass bounces with you like a trampoline. This phenomenon is caused by soil liquefaction. Excess water from heavy rain or floods becomes trapped in the soil, causing it to be waterlogged. This makes the ground temporarily act like a giant waterbed. While it may be tempting to run and bounce on this springy grass, 
it's best to tread carefully. The grass could potentially break open, and if someone fell through, it would be incredibly tricky for them to get back out again. An erupting volcano is already a pretty terrifying sight, with clouds of dark smoke and flowing molten hot lava. What's even more terrifying is that they can produce lightning. Volcanic lightning is pretty hard to study, so scientists don't know exactly what causes it. A common theory is that during an eruption, the ash picks up so much friction that it creates a buildup of static electricity. This static electricity then triggers the volcanic lightning. A fire whirl, or fire tornado, is exactly what it sounds like. They occur when ground winds pick up flames and escalate the embers into a whirling force. These spinning columns of fire can reach up to 1,000 feet tall, but luckily, they only last for a couple of minutes. Fire tornadoes are pretty rare, but they can be extremely dangerous. In Tokyo in 1923, a large city-wide fire produced a gigantic fire tornado. The tornado lasted 15 minutes and devastated the city, causing significant damage and leaving 38,000 people injured. On a cold and cloudless winter night, you might have been lucky enough to witness colorful beams of blue and orange light reaching up towards the sky. These are called light pillars. They occur when light is reflected from tiny ice crystals that float about in the atmosphere. These pillars are more common in cold, northern countries like Canada or Russia. We've all seen the colorful rainbow arches that the sun produces. It's much rarer to see a rainbow light up in the sky, produced by the moon. This is called a moonbow. It's bright and colorful like a rainbow and occurs when moonlight reflects off water droplets in the sky. Moonbows are incredibly rare and can only occur in specific conditions. The moon must be very low, the sky has to be dark, and rain must fall directly opposite from the moon to create this lunar rainbow. If you're taking a moonlit stroll along the beach at night, you might come across the strange phenomena of a bioluminescent beach. This occurs when a microorganism in the water called plankton are agitated by the movement of the waves and give off a bright blue color. These microorganisms tend to live in warmer waters, so you can find these luminescent beaches in places like the Maldives, Puerto Rico, and even Florida. In Antarctica, you'll find the famous Blood Falls. Blood red colored water pours out of the Taylor Glacier from an underground lake. Scientists originally believed that the striking color was caused by a microorganism similar to the luminescent beaches glowing plankton. But after further studies, it was discovered that the water has abnormally high levels of iron that oxidize and turn to rust the second they hit fresh air. In colder climates where lakes are frozen all year round, if you look pretty closely beneath the icy waters, you'll notice frozen bubbles trapped in the ice. These are small pockets of methane gas. Bacteria in the water feast on other organisms and digest them to produce methane. The methane turns into floating bubbles in the frozen water, trapped beneath layers of ice. Asparatus clouds are one of the rarest events in nature. This cloud formation consists of incredibly dark and storm-like waves of clouds. Although these clouds appear ominous and look like they carry a heavy storm, they usually dissipate without ever affecting the weather. These clouds most commonly appear in the Great Plains of the United States, but they haven't been observed since 2009. Despite being a famously harsh climate, the desert can produce some beautiful things, like desert roses. These are intricate rose-like formations of crystal clusters. The intense switch between dry and wet conditions forms the crystals and traps grains of sand within them to give them their signature color. From afar, you could easily mistake a water spout as a large tornado traveling over a body of water. In reality, water spouts are a type of funnel-shaped cloud. They are rotating columns of cloud-filled wind which often take on a darker color. Water spouts are much weaker and smaller than tornadoes, and they aren't strong enough to suck anything into them. This phenomenon typically occurs in tropical climates, and they usually dissipate before reaching land. Lenticular clouds are flat clouds that lay on top of the other, looking like stacks of pancakes in the sky. They typically form in high altitudes where geographic features like mountains or tall buildings interrupt the airflow. Because of their unique shape, lenticular clouds have been suggested as an explanation for some UFO sightings. As our climate changes, new natural phenomena develop. One of these is exploding permafrost. The increasing temperature in Arctic zones is causing the permafrost to melt. Just like in frozen lakes, bubbles of methane gas are trapped in the permafrost. As the permafrost begins to melt, the gas is released. 
This results in large explosions in the ground, which leave behind massive holes. The first case of this was reported in 2013, and several more have been reported since. When you think of icebergs, you usually think of a large chunk of pristine white ice. But in Antarctica, you find icebergs striped with colors of green, blue, yellow, and more. The different colors are caused due to the ice forming in special conditions. Green typically appears when water that is rich in algae freezes. Blue stripes are more often freshly frozen water. Other colors are typically caused by sediments of debris picked up by the water as it freezes. Nacreous clouds are some of the rarest clouds on the planet. They typically occur at high altitudes and are only visible within two hours after sunset. The clouds appear beautiful as they display light waves of various colors. But don't be fooled, these clouds are actually a pretty dangerous sight. Nacreous clouds are incredibly destructive to our atmosphere. Their presence encourages the chemical reaction that breaks down our ozone layer. The ozone layer is an essential shield protecting us from the sun's harmful rays. The more depleted it is, the more at risk we are of global warming. The last place you might expect to find a natural fire is in the middle of a waterfall, but it's more common than you think. In upstate New York, in the middle of a small running waterfall is an eternal flame around 8 inches tall. Beneath the waterfall is a natural gas seep, a low pressure of gas that escapes from underground into the Earth's atmosphere. The small fire is sheltered enough by rocks from the waterfall's spray to stay lit permanently. Typically, green sand isn't what you'd imagine when you think of tropical beaches, but in Hawaii and other volcanic islands around the globe, you'll find beaches covered with dark green sand. This remarkable color is due to the erosion of olivine, a type of rock formed by nearby volcanic eruptions. Over the years, the rock slowly withers into sand and washes onto the shore, resulting in these strange colored beaches. Penitentes are fields of ice spikes formed in high altitudes. These occur when sunlight beams directly onto ice, turning it into water vapor rather than melting them. The sunbeams vaporize small dimples in the snow surface, resulting in sharp crystal-like formations. The spike can grow as tall as 15 feet. Mammatus clouds are some of the most unusual and distinctive formations of clouds. The clouds can extend over hundreds of miles and appear like the sky has been blanketed with cotton balls. The clouds themselves are harmless, but they often signify that a dangerous storm is nearby. So if you see them, head inside. A green flash sunset is a rare phenomenon that occurs briefly at sunset, or sunrise, when the sun is almost entirely out of the sky. In the right conditions, onlookers can witness a distinct green flash, making the sun appear bright green. This is caused by sunlight reflecting off the Earth's atmosphere, causing the light to refract into different colors. The sun appears green, but really, it's just an optical illusion. The monster holds onto a blade of grass, reaching its front legs out, ready to grab the next innocent bystander. If you saw it, you'd think it's a referee doing the touchdown signal. But no, this tick is questing. Not on a quest. I mean, it's sitting there, waiting for lunch in victory pose. It's really called questing in the tick world. But back to the eerie hair-raising stuff. Cue the music! Right now, it's smelling and scanning the space around it. This beast is hungry, and it's waiting for you to get closer. Just a little more, almost there, and gotcha! You fell right into this parasite's ambush, and it's already crawling up your pants leg. Ticks aren't just forest dwellers, they're everywhere. In the city park or your beautiful suburban yard, where you're not as likely to see one is crawling around on your walls. I mean, habitually. Like that guy right there. Yeah, him. Zoom in. Looks like a tick to me. No, zoom in closer. There, that's better. See, this is no tick. It's a crab spider. The Zysticus kind, to be exact. Since crab spiders come in all colors and sizes, oh, just you wait. For now, this little guy is brown. Easily recognizable from his longer forearms, uh, make that longer forearms in the front, and shorter four back legs. Like a crab, yeah. Must have been what the scientist who named it thought, too. But it's mostly the way they move that won them the nickname. They walk sideways like a crab on the beach. From a distance, it looks like a tick. Up close, not really at all. The crab spider's body is broken up into two sections like any old regular spidey. 
or, as they're called in the scientific community, Arachnida hurry grab my slipperus. Okay, I made that second part up. Looking closely at a tick, you'll notice its body is just one solid flat piece. Well, flat before lunch. It's also slightly triangular. Now, grab a magnifying glass and look really close. I dare you. You'll see crab spiders have eight eyes. Ticks have none. Remember, they see the world by smelling with their feet. Weird, I know. Ticks are parasites. Duh. They feed on us and other animals like walking juice boxes. A crab spider has no interest in your blood. It's hunting for insects in your house. So if you suddenly see more of these guys crawling around, it means their lunch has entered your home. So don't be offended by them showing up uninvited. They're just going where the food is. And definitely, don't be so rude as to squish them. They're just trying to keep your house clean. They're hunting spiders, so they eat by going out and catching their grub, not waiting around passively for a silk net to do all the work. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Black Widow. Okay, that's not entirely true. Crab spiders, like ticks, wait for lunch to come close enough. Then they use those long front legs to snatch it up and... And that's why they come in so many colors. The bright ones wait in ambush on vibrant flowers and fruits. The brown ones blend in better with tree branches and leaves. And crab spiders can produce silk. They just don't make webs. They use their built-in grappling hook to get around. And now, the million-dollar question. Do they wear fancy hats? No, I mean, are crab spiders venomous? Yep, sure are. But their tiny little mouth parts could never get through your skin or your pets. So rest easy. Now, the same can't be said about their cousin, the giant crab spider. It goes by another, more famous name, the huntsman spider. And this thing is big, ew, and fast. Its mouth parts can get through your skin, so don't touch them, just run. There you go! Now, when nature created this insect, it thought, Let's do a butterfly with an alligator's head attached to it. Oh, and make it look like a peanut. There. Ready! Scientists so graciously called this thing Fulgora latinaria, but peanut head sounds better. This peanut-headed lanternfly is large and, like a skunk, it knows how to let out an odorous spray to scare enemies away. Those menacing fake eyes on the wings help too. The strongest survives in the jungle. But what if you're small and defenseless? Option 1. Hide your whole life. Option 2. Pretend to be the baddest guy in the forest and everyone will be afraid of you. The caterpillar of the elephant hawk moth chose the second route. Ironically, it resembles neither an elephant nor a hawk. If an enemy shows up, this thing goes into snake mode. The caterpillar pulls its head into its body like a turtle. This puffs its body up and it looks like a snake head. It's got fake eyes and everything. Oh, it puts on a whole show. It sways to the sides all serpent-like. Whatever was about to gobble it up decides, "Uh uh-oh, I'll just be on my way. Now, back to spiders. But wait, not all of them look like walking nightmares. Head to Hawaii to find the happy face spider. Its real face might not be especially joyous looking for an arachnid, but the pattern on its back sure looks happy to see you. Fun fact, and that's what I do here, The pattern can change from the spider's food. I'd pay to see what it looks like when it eats something spicy. Whoa, watch out! A giant hornet coming right at you! Nah, just kidding. It's only another master of disguise. This is a hornet moth. No stingers, no worries. And this bug also has learned to mimic the movements of its fashion icon, the hornet. It flies with quick jerking motions. With the leaf bug, everything's clear. It walks and looks like a tree leaf, down to the finest detail. It even has brown spots around the edges to look like a leaf drying out. And their eggs look like seeds. The disguise is great, but Houston, we have a problem. The beetle has to remain motionless for most of its life. Hanging there, waiting for lunch to come by, and hoping their enemies don't catch on to the act. And here's the coolest part. If the insect needs to move, it starts dancing like a leaf blowing in the wind. The ghost mantis has also perfected the art of leaf mimicking. Only this guy's more into the autumn look. It's like a brown crumpled leaf that's fallen from a tree. 
The mantis has a thin body, and the color depends on how much water is next to its tree and how much shadow is underneath it. When this insect hides, finding it is next to impossible. Perhaps you're more into the branchy look? Then I present to you the walking stick. This bug lives in trees and practically doesn't move. You're thinking, yeah, okay, I've seen those in my backyard, big whoop. But have you seen a gargantuan stick insect? The biggest one found is as long as your back. Bugs have even started copying simple thorns, though probably more effective than just a harmless leaf. The thorn bug's name says it all. Touch me and you'll get pricked. (laughs) Come on, you wimp. But it's recruited its friends to help keep enemies away. They huddle together and turn an otherwise smooth, thornless branch into a spiny ouch place. Hungry birds see this, (laughs) they're smart, and decide not to land there. Hey, who forgot to close the portal to the parallel universe full of unearthly monsters? Actually, you're still on Earth, and you share the planet with this thing. If you're in Southeast Asia or Australia anyways. Here's what the scientists call it. Creatinus ganges. But I'll name him Tentacle Bug. Yeah, Tentacle Bug doesn't usually look like this. He usually looks like your average moth, because that's what he is. But when he's trying to attract a partner, he shoots two pairs of massive tentacles from his bottom part. With them, the moth sprays not poison, but pheromones. Those are like smelly good chemicals that attract females. And it works, eh? To each his own. 12. Harvard scientists discovered 60 species of new insects in the jungles of Suriname. The main find was an unusual bug with grasshopper eyes and bizarre silvery hair. They dubbed it the troll-haired insect because sometimes you just call it as you see it. That silver tail is a wax the insect puts out to keep enemies away. It also cushions the bug's landing when it falls. Imagine you woke up this morning, had breakfast, and went about your business. But instead of clothes, you stuck toast, scrambled eggs, and fried bacon to your body. Odd? Yes. But what else can you do? On the way to the bus, a bird might swoop down and grab you. Okay, this technique works for the emerald moth caterpillar. The bug sticks flower petals to itself and dines on those same flowers. There, now the analogy makes sense. When this flower suit goes bad, the caterpillar collects a new one. It uses its silk to stick the petals on, and thus goes the cycle of this little guy's life of playing dress-up every day. And now, for some risky restaurant business. Pufferfish is a Japanese delicacy and something akin to Russian roulette in the world of food. Its highly poisonous flesh contains tetrodotoxin, which is 1,200 times more toxic than cyanide. Yum! Normally, people can't stay alive if they eat this fish, yet Japanese chefs are trained to remove the poisonous parts for the $200 delicacy named fugu. That's pricey! It's almost completely banned in the U.S. There are only a few authorized places that sell it. A, uh, can I say people are dying to get it? I can't? Okay, so I won't. Another food band in the US is Kazu Marzu, which is rotten cheese in Italian. If you ever feel like trying it, head to Sardinia, Italy. Basically, it's some sheep milk cheese. Special flies are allowed to leave eggs in it that are left in the cheese for 40 days. This delicacy has some live maggots that take care of decomposing the cheese giving it that mmm, distinctive texture and spicy flavor. It's banned in the U.S. for sanitary reasons. (laughs) You think? Unlike soft and creamy kazu marzu, kherpi is known to be the world's hardest cheese. Just like any regular cheese, it's made from milk. Its main difference is that it stays fresh for up to 20 years. The milk is quite special, too. The cows, which are actually a cross between cows and yaks, eat a variety of mountain herbs. Cheese made from this savory milk has unique flavor. National Jamaican fruit aki has a unique taste. It's quite mild, its texture is buttery and creamy, and it tastes just like scrambled eggs. It's safe to eat aki only as long as it's fully ripe. Beware, though! The only edible part is the white creamy flesh itself. 
toxic pink flesh and black seeds are a total uh uh-uh. One of the traditional Jamaican dishes with this fruit is called aki and saltfish. Well, at least it's codfish, not pufferfish. Another thing that should be 100% ripe in order to be safe is elderberry. These berries are quite famous, though. You can find them in pies, syrups, teas, jams, you name it. Process these berries properly, though, since they contain cyanide. Fully ripe and cooked berries aren't dangerous. That's good to know. Actually, almost all the pits and stones contain cyanide. Your favorite cherries have it, too. The amount is small and isn't likely to cause any harm, but still, try not to swallow them. Same with peaches, plums, and apricots. Just don't chew on them for too long. Now, if you're a fan of seafood, you probably want to try some sanakchi. It's some seasoned baby octopus tentacles. Well, the problem is that these are still alive. Those who have never tried this Korean dish claim the tentacles can still move on the plate and can stick to the inner part of your mouth since the suction function is maintained. Suction function, suction function. Meanwhile, another fun food fact. Greenland sharks don't have any urinary tract, and all the waste they produced is basically filtered through flesh and skin, so their flesh is toxic. Sounds like a good reason not to eat them. But not in Iceland. Nope. Hockerol, which is processed shark meat, is first hung to dry for 3-5 to five months. In the end, you get something like ammonia-smelling fermented fish with a jelly texture that reminds of wet bread. Mm-mm. Cassava is a poisonous tropical root of two types. The sweet variation does contain some cyanide, but it's enough to cook it to reduce the toxic content to a <laughs> safe level. To get rid of all the toxins in bitter cassava, it's necessary to grate the root, then soak it, and finally cook properly to make it edible. This root is very starchy, and its flavor is really subtle. Cassava can be used just like potatoes, mashed, boiled, or fried. And uh, I'd like a side of cassava, please, and uh, hold the cyanide. Rhubarb doesn't seem to fit in this list of notorious dishes, but it actually has its downsides. Its leaves are super toxic, containing oxalic acid, and should never ever be used for cooking, baking, or whatever you want to do. If you ever try to eat one, the least serious consequences are a burning sensation all over the mouth, nausea, and breathing problems. If you live in the States and you're under 47, chances are you've never tried haggis, since it was banned almost a half a century ago. This Scottish pudding is made of a full range of sheep's inner parts. We'll spare you the details. Plus, some oatmeal, a lot of minced onions, suet, just don't ask, and some broth. It's quite crumbly and coarse, and it's also spicy. It's usually served with mashed potatoes or mashed turnip on the side. Well, at least it's not mashed cassava. Well, by the way, potatoes aren't that harmless either. It all depends on whether they're ripe or not. So-called green potatoes are full of toxins, and potato sprouts contain solanine, which is quite toxic. Same with green almonds and cashews that are full of cyanide if not ripe enough. Luckily, the nuts we get at the supermarkets are well-processed, which means they're completely safe. There's one bistro in Bangkok where they've been cooking the same beef and noodle soup for 45 years. Literally, the same. It's been simmering for over four decades. The broth has never been thrown away. It's always kept overnight for the next day's soup. They never wash the pan to keep the unique flavor. There's a massive grease rim around that huge pan formed as a result of 45 years non-stop simmering spillovers. Please, be my guest. Chinese century eggs aren't white and yellow. They're black and gray when you peel them. And the outside color is brownish-green. To cook this savory Chinese delicacy, all you need is some tea, quick lime, salt, wood ashes, and some water to mix it all together. Dip the raw eggs in this paste and roll them in rice husks so they won't stick to each other. Let it sit for 100 years. Nah, just kidding. 10 days are enough when it's hot. For colder weather, it may take up to 30 days. Hey, don't go. It gets better. Bird droppings seem no delicacy, but in Greenland, there's a local dish actually based on them. 
It's called Urumit, says here, and is made of ptarmigan droppings. Mmm. They collect them in winter and when they're dry and cook them together with some rancid sea oil and some sea meat. The droppings cooked this way taste somewhat like gorgonzola. Um, check please. Surprisingly, harmless tuna can be pretty dangerous. Big fish live a long life in the ocean. The problem is, the mercury level in oceans has significantly risen over the last several decades, and the fish absorb it into their flesh. If you eat a lot of tuna or any other big ocean fish, you risk mercury toxicity. It's not that you should stop eating it, just monitor the weekly consumption. As for tuna, their eyeballs are quite a popular delicacy in China and Japan. Tuna eyeballs need to be boiled before eating, thank goodness. And some seasoning is required too. If you nail it, you'll have a delicacy that tastes like squid and stares back at you. Hey, on the good side, it costs less than a dollar. Red kidney beans are actually somewhat poisonous too. You might have never noticed or even known that, but it's because we eat all of them well-processed. Cooked and baked beans expose no danger, while the raw kidney beans have a toxic protein in them. In order to get rid of it, you gotta first soak them well, preferably overnight, and change the water before boiling. When they're soft, they're nothing but a great source of non-toxic proteins and other nutrients. In Cambodia, you can try a crunchy, crispy snack that tastes a bit like crab. It's deep-fried and seasoned. The main ingredient is a tarantula. Now, this doesn't quite sound like a lunch. Now, this soup, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, is definitely scrumptious. The taste is sharp yet delicate, and it tastes just like shrimps. Well, this traditional Laotian dish sounds really cool until you realize it's made of ant eggs. To give it a bit of sourness, they also tend to add a few tiny ants. In Mexico, you don't throw away corn kernels turned black because they're rotten. You keep them as a culinary specialty called, um, this name. Fungus all over the kernel gives it that earthy, woody smell. Mmm, mmm, getting hungry? Some dishes just need the decoration, especially cakes and pies. In England, there's a pie called stargazy. The name speaks for itself. The sardines, accompanied by potatoes and eggs, peek out of the pie crust and stare at the skies. Sometimes these are the tails that point at the skies, though. Tea mushroom is another weird thing they drink in East Europe together with sour milk-based drinks. It's basically some fermented black or green tea. It's made by adding a whole culture of bacteria – they're not consumed, they just ferment the drink – to sweeten tea, where sugar acts like yeast. Add juice, spice, or whatever you want to taste. Well, I've had about enough of this. Think I'm gonna barf. Bye for now. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click